changes in animals in the future and you have more nefarious goals, they don't need to be human. Specifically, this is going to allow us to skip a lot of steps as far as what we would need to do. Anybody ever gotten chased or bit by a dog before, by the way? It's terrifying. Okay, all the instincts that humans have go nuts and you start running and it's not good. I had to save my stupid little Shiba Inu from a Malamute once and got like right there. It was really scary. She was a good dog. My dog's a shit. He, he kind of deserved it. He had bit her through the fence before, so wasn't too good. Speaking of, I saw this and thought it was hilarious. Sorry. So speaking of things that did survive evolution and did survive humans, did you survive? Yes. What did it cost? Everything. Poor <laughs> dog. That sounds cute. And here's the original in case it's T-Rex and a chicken, but I thought I could make it for Scout and that'd be funny, but good times. Hooray. Genes, genes flow as genes go. Now, we didn't get to end on this with CRISPR, but problems, problems, problems. This is not as easy as anybody would, as much as I advertise it and as high as our success rate was for the lab experiments, there's all kinds of stuff that can go wrong with this. There's all kinds of, if you had a thousand embryos, you'd probably lose, I don't know, depending on the changes you want, 800 to 700 of them, let's say. So, I mean, if we're looking at stuff, big one is right here is off target effects. You will expect about 20 to 30 nicks in the genome of regions that look pretty close to whatever your gRNA says. So, all those off target mistakes. God forbid they actually end up in a real life gene, right? Let's say you got copies of a gene too. Here's another big issue. You got more than two copies of certain genes, which plenty of genes exist that way. You're gonna be wanting to make all of those changes. It's hard enough to hit it twice, by the way. So remember, you gotta make two changes. One of the hardest things we had to do during my PhD time was make just a small point mutation and a fix but it couldn't be just in one copy. It had to be in both. So you had to find that cell. And it was one out of 2,200 samples and it was awful. Don't do PhDs. Okay, next one. You gotta get it to the right cell at the right time. And this is tough in an adult human. Now we can rely on certain things here. We know that certain viruses target certain cells. We can give the virus that CRISPR capability, send it in, it's not too bad. We've seen liposomes and their ability to kind of hide from the immune system, right? The way that viruses will get caught very quickly. Stem cells is a risk bet, high risk, high reward. You send in stem cells with the edited stuff in and you hope they sort of renew the population. That can have extremely good and smooth results. But as we've talked about, sometimes stem cells decide to become bone or intestine or brain cells in the wrong spot, right? Not a good time. Equally, um, some of the smaller mistakes, things like this. Let's actually talk about this down here. Those are the main things I'd say. It's hard to deliver. You will make some mistakes because there's plenty of 20 nucleotide regions in the genome that you're trying to edit and uh, they're a little similar to the others. Now, remember I told you we could do translocations or if you try to do multiple CRISPR NICs at one time, the bottom result is the uh, whoops that you might encounter here. If you make multiple CRISPR NICs, there's a good solid chance you will exchange pieces of chromosomes by accident, oops. And suddenly you'll end up with this Franken chromosome of sorts and your embryo's dead or malformed or something. And by embryo, I don't always mean human, obviously. We're doing this mainly in plants, animals right now. So it's not perfect. Hideous translocation mistakes are a huge issue if you try to do multiple CRISPR hits. That's why right now, any human trial that's working is still right now about in one hit at a time. The little pigs that we saw that were making their organs more approachable for humans, 67 changes, they have their own system of fixing this and making sure, but trust me, there's a lot of mistakes that happen. It's a lot of pigs that come out or don't come out and it's not a good time, okay? But kind of obligation that you'll see with CRISPR here is that since it exists and since we've damaged things so badly already, is it the obligation to use what we've created on our path of you know, somewhat destruction 
to fix things. So looking at photosynthesis here, could we bring back trees or algae? Could we engineer algae that could be a better carbon sink, for example? And is that sort of the destiny of what we've created here? Do we make corals that could survive acidic ocean temperatures? What would that look like next to non-manipulated corals? Who would own that region, right? What investment would happen in the Great Barrier Reef if you had to renew it like this? And at the same time, this was that patient, David Sanchez, he's in a good Netflix series on CRISPR, and so that's why I highlighted him. I told you about sickle cell, a valine for glutamate, I believe. He has both atypical copies, immune to malaria, but oxygen's tough. You can send in CRISPR right now. The virus sends in CRISPR, CRISPR does its thing, and it fixes the allele. So about half his cells turn into the normal hemoglobin shape, a typical shape suddenly. But at the same time, he has a really poignant quote is that he wouldn't be as powerful, as tough as he was if he hadn't had that disease, if he hadn't had that challenge with him. The emotional appeal when this starts working, and trust me, this is working, things like this, it will be a very different conversation about how to, I don't know, distribute things, I'd say, I don't know. The good thing with this is that it still is, there is a path towards affordability with this. The car T's, like I said, that's gonna be tough. Right now we're still working on teams of scientists with something like that. But CRISPR, when you refine it and you get it pretty good, I'm not saying this works for everybody that tries this. But the fact that you can cure, basically cure genetic ailments or change genetic ailments in a, he's not an adult, but he's a fully functioning human. He didn't do this at an embryo stage. There's trillions of cells in him and this worked. So you don't have to turn anything in. This kind of start end on CRISPR for a little bit. So if you had to choose one of these questions, this is always kind of a fun way to kind of reflect on what you do. And it's always so fun because during the CRISPR lectures, everybody's always like, I'm always like, would you guys change yourself? And everybody's like, no, like it's some unholy thing. Are you kidding? I'd love to be taller. <laughs> I had a kid at the same as he was like, what? I want to be taller. I want to dunk. I want good tendons. <laughs> he was like, I want to be smarter. And I was like, there you go, Taylor. Good job. See, and he just like fired the class up. So, hey, if it works, it works, right? And the thing is, is if you fix one thing, you can fix anything almost. Any Mendelian trait, any point mutation allele, it's on the table now. If you had to choose one thing, what would it be? Like I said, this is more just for you guys to think a little bit about. I'm not obligated, I'm not gonna judge your answers on this. And again, you're not turning this in either, so it's okay if you just wanna think about it. I just always think it's a good time to like take pause at where we're at. Yeah, I'm trying to think, what else would I, what would I change? Hmm. I want to be able to read a little faster so I can watch my subtitle shows. I don't know. God. If I could read a little faster, my ACT reading section wouldn't have been the disaster and cataclysm that it was. Ugh. Too soon. So the more you think about this, remember, yes, there are mistakes and this is tough and it's not always just like snap, it's possible. But we are very much in the realm of if you want to do something, you probably can at this point. That question will start to become more about what direction we take something in. Sweet. So who saw Dune, right? With the little buzzies? Yeah, yeah. It was kind of cool. Yeah, if you could engineer something big or like plants that would make buildings that grow into specific shapes, right? Eco-engineered cities, stuff like that, like sci-fi stuff, you'd never believe. It's, just, it's the beginning of those ideas that are fun for me. And when you consider that someday if, you, if, you, if Homo sapiens do try and travel for far distances, probably won't be homo sapiens. They'll have to be edited versions of us. <laughs> Funny enough, they'll have to be smaller to fit. They'll also have to eat less. They'll have to be resistant to radiation. They'll have all, need to all have all kinds of different traits that we don't encounter on Earth, but you would encounter in a journey in space. Because remember, our best bet right now for Earth-like planets outside of Mars is like a, let's say we even get like higher speed type stuff. Um, you're looking at probably generations living on a ship and then getting off and then finally making it. So not, not super pretty, but the fact is if somebody exists that can live that long through that, 
They're not gonna be just like us. Equally, last little bit that CRISPR can help with, but something different. Currently, you have four nucleotides to choose from, two base pairs. These make 64 codons for 20 amino acids. That's a good system. We get away with quite a bit with this. But if you diversified that and you introduce new chemistry, two additional nucleotides, an additional base pair, the math starts to get interesting. Because remember with amino acids, it's that R group that changes. It's that little special side chain, right? You can add anything you want on those things. So you can imagine a little bacterial system or a cell, cell free system, you give it all these chemicals and could it create something interesting, right? Because at the end of the day, it's just chemistry. If you introduced it to changes and forced it to, forced millions of these little organisms to utilize different genetics, you always wonder what could, what could happen here. This is one arena where life will always have sort of a unique heads up on something like AI. That a plate of bacteria given these tools will likely be able to create something more useful and more refined than a prediction of, a, of an algorithm, at least for now. The algorithms are quite good and they're getting better. Okay, sweet. So kind of ends our CRISPR doom and gloom, but also happiness and such. And we can actually get into the immune system a little bit. So I've asked you this question before. Is it possible for somebody to live forever? What are the barriers to that? First initial barriers we saw is that DNA replication has sort of a timer on you. That timer with telomerase being active is a good check on cancer cells. But even if we fix that, what about all the bad stuff that's coming to get us, right? Wouldn't we eventually succumb to that? But we'll answer this question as well. And we'll see sort of one of the more disturbing twists of all of biology as far as humans go as well. But I want you to consider what the final job of the immune system might be. Those of you that know this, don't blurt it out. It's really terrifying. Now, getting into it, immunogenetics. You'll see that this lecture, kind of like I said in the email, a lot of the next, I mean, we only have four more, right? A lot of that time will be spent on some practice stuff. It'll be spent on bigger applications like this. And you'll see that a lot of the exam questions, and you'll see this in the practice questions, they will be, they will grace the context of what we're doing with the immune system. And the immune system provides us a lot of tools, but I am not going to strictly ask you what's the difference between innate and adaptive immune systems, right? That's not what this class is. I want to show you the tools that we have and the things we can engineer. Go for it. Now, what you're looking at is a T cell killing a cancer cell. Pretty sweet. They're very good at what they do, your immune system cells. And they are the ones that determine one last phenotype. Think about everything that we've studied with COVID the last two years, right? Who dies and who lives? If you want to use that as the, as the metric, the very contemporary one. Does that come down to genetics? Partially. Comes down to a couple other things too. First, meet some fun characters. All the diseases that we currently deal with, the big bad ones, they are a consequence of civilization in most case. Specific pieces of civilization in each case as well. Smallpox started in cows. Plague, that's on rats with fleas and et cetera. Malaria, you need standing water for rice, for mosquitoes, cholera, poop. Tuberculosis, just a nice general livestock lung disease, hooray. So meeting these characters, what they do is you can look back in populations and see that people that lived in areas near smallpox, their immune cells carry inherent tools that can kill smallpox on site very easily, or at least bacteria that look like it, or sorry, viruses that look like it. Europeans with ancestry close to the area where the plague basically ripped through everything and killed everybody that wasn't resistant or, you know, quote unquote, fit enough to survive it. To this day, you still carry genes that are very good at killing bacteria that look like Ursina pestis. And like we talked about with sickle cell, the ultimate disease against humanity is malaria. We have an inherent resistance to genetic mechanism, but your immune cells can also have steps to take care of this. This is a very good way to track populations, but equally it's a good way to look at biocultural evolution, which is what humans do now. The consequences of how we change the environment hit back at us 
and our populations do change. The past does confer resistance to certain pieces. Peoples with ancestry that have seen coronaviruses in their historical biocultural evolution are typically built with more tools to withstand that infection on site. What you're seeing here is an HIV virus. The ability of it to find a T cell and get in is destroyed if this CCR5 Delta immune gene is gone, actually. There are populations in Europe and other areas of the world that lack this gene and thus they are immune to the virus. That is because of past exposure to retroviruses that look and behave somewhat similar to HIV, not the same virus. But that past resistance can come through as a cell receptor, a gene. Those of us likely, there's one of us in here maybe without that gene, just means it's a defunct version, doesn't make, there's no hook on host site for the virus. Equally, let's meet some fun characters as well. Here's everything your immune system needs to kill. Pretty tough. Prions, you have no shot. Everything else you've got a pretty good shot at and you have the tools to defeat with some of the genes that we'll see today. Viruses, kind of familiar with that. Bacteria, prokaryotes, fungi, that's, that's coming later maybe. We'll see, hopefully not. Now, I have a question in black, which one of these do we not actually deal with on a day-to-day -day basis or even a lifetime basis anymore, right? Don't raise your hand, but how many of y'all have worms ever, right? <laughs> yeah, you don't actually do it. We don't deal with big multicellular parasites very much anymore. A lot of public health things got us uh, good on that. Now, we'll see this though. That does not mean that you don't have and breed immune cells inside of you that are hunting and looking for parasites right now as we speak, and they're angry that they can't find any. So let's take a look at some of the first initial tools we'll have. We'll take a break after innate. How do we prevent infection from ever getting in? So something called innate immunity. As far as genetics go, you are born with these capabilities. Now, everybody's capabilities exist on a uh, spectrum of strength. Now, one of your nonspecific immune barriers is literally your skin. Awesome. Can't get in. The other one, mucus, gross. Catches all the stuff that you're sniffing in, right? Some people make different kinds of mucus, I guess, maybe. I don't know. The real differences usually get into cells like these. And very much, this is a polygenic trait with, with massive strength being on the right and less well-prepared innate cells on the left. I know, I'm like a eugenicist up here being like strong and weak up here. Shoot, sorry. Basically, you have a lot of cells that are born with instincts to kill certain things and to perform certain roles. They're plasma proteins called complement that they are just shaped to bind to stuff that looks like bacteria and they just kill it. You have phagocytes that run around and eat little pieces of bacteria or virus. They just know what it looks like. They know it's not you. And they have cell receptors, genes that tell them how to do that. Dendritic cells, too complicated for this class. Natural killer cells, let's actually meet them. And that's what NK stands for. And they are about as cool as they sound. A natural killer cell is one of your best examples of genetics, humans at work, pure, passed down, the whole thing. No epigenetics, no, no crap. They just show up with receptors that can kill bacteria and can kill viruses. You gotta remember, like I said, there's like millions of bacteria on your hand, for example. I mean, bite your nails, pick your nose or something, all of a sudden, there's a ton. Natural killer cells are one of your first cellular defenses against all the stuff that you are sniffing and touching all the time and eating and breathing. So these things, these NK cells, they're just born with the tools to what to look for. They're just in your genome in this case. You're not involving anything crazy. Some people have more receptors than others though. So, Notice that everything we're looking at too in the blue, it's all stuff that is not in a human cell. So the reason you take cell biology and the reason you learn prokaryote versus eukaryote 
is that medicine always tries to find the piece that doesn't look like you and kill it. Your immune cells do the same thing. Anything in here that does not look like self or you, because your immune system has educated itself about what you look like and what your cells look like, it will start to freak out and kill. Okay, these were our first innate immune genes, toll-like receptors, TR, TLRs. Each one of them is a gene, each one of them is a receptor. Each one of them has a specific target. Each one of those targets in gray is either bacterial or viral in nature. Notice that some of these targets represent some of the biotech engineer things that we're like, hey, take this DNA, this will do well. Take this RNA, it'll knock this gene out for you. These are the first thing that you have to overcome to make that happen. Because these are littered throughout NK cells, some of your other cells. And the minute they find their partner, their target up there, they'll lose their mind. Now, this is where everybody is a little different sometimes. Some of us don't have all of these. Some of us have a spectrum of them. Some of us, has, some of us have extra copies of TLR2 and 6, for example. Some of us are much better with TLR8, and we are very immune to viruses, for example. So everybody's different. This is that sliding scale that I'm showing you here. This is somewhat additive, to say the least, right? More receptors means a little better each time. Now, you have TLRLs that poke out and see like, hey, what's outside the cell? <clears throat> you have others that actually exist in most of your cells that look inside and they say, is something infecting me? Okay, now this is a genetics class, not an immunology class. So we'll settle on that. You have genes that are built in to fight and kill certain things that do not look human. It's a polygenic trait. It's pretty straightforward. So take a break now. We'll answer this question in a sec. Oh, God damn it. All right. <laughs> last, last scary exam video for everybody. And I will finish what you started. Gary. Doom. You guys are doomed. All right, from now on the videos are positive. You guys are gonna be good. Don't worry, hopefully.
finish that orchestra out. It's really good. All right. Now, next question. Yeah, hopefully you guys have taken some look at the practice questions. You'll notice they're they're comprehensive. They're unique. It'll be it's going to be biblical. It's going to be great. All right, you'll be fine. <laughs> all right. Problem is, we have all encountered disease, pathogen, pestilence that you have never seen before. Everybody's, well, some of us have jumped into the Colorado River and sniffed up a parasite accidentally and had to go to the emergency room. Oops, gross. The scenario, it exists. It exists for all of us that have had COVID before. Our body had never seen it. And for a lot of us, we didn't have the inherent tools to kill it. Some of us, we did. And by us, I don't know. I never, supposedly I've never had it. But how do you come up with calculated responses to something you've never seen, something no human's ever seen before? So according to a virologist, there were two options. One was that you would just be 100 trillion cells of pus and immune cells. So we didn't want that. Or you would have to evolve a specific response in real time. You'd have to manipulate genes and fate to beat whatever has shown up against you. What we have here is, let's say, an unknown bacterium or an unknown virus. What our immune cells can do is find and chew up pieces of those virus. Now, even let's say that bacteria, that virus is winning the fight and our inherent defenses don't know what to do with it. Maybe it has a way to camouflage, maybe it's killing them, maybe it's silencing them, who knows. But if we can take this little bit of protein right here, we can basically use that as a blueprint to mount a defense. So what you're looking at on the right, what we're gonna see are the roles of a B cell and a T cell. Everything on the left is what we kind of covered a little bit. Now you're not responsible, it's blue text. You're not responsible for knowing what an eosinophil is versus a neutrophil, I don't care. I wanna make sure that mainly the thing we're doing here is showing that you will have to manipulate your genome in a B cell to mount a response to something that no human's ever seen, that you have no evolution against, you have no innate good defense against. So let's look at how this happens. First things first, we have these good antigens right here. These are pieces, little crumbs of whatever is infecting you at this point. Some of your B cells, and there exist, you know, they're probably in your lymph nodes, you might have like 5 million B cells running around. These little receptors right here are diverse. There's lots of these, but they're all, they're unique to, to a single cell each time. So each cell has clones of the receptor, but there are tons of different variations in the cells themselves. So what happens is if it's a good fit on this little receptor, if that active site or if that binding site can fit that piece of disease, whatever it is, what that's gonna do is trigger a response in the B cell and say like, hey, I'm a good fit. That response is going to tell a T cell that says, hey, you're a good fit. Why don't you grow a little more aggressively? Why don't you make some more copies of yourself? You seem to be a good customer, you seem to be a good fit for this. Now, if that cycle repeats enough times, and this binding antibody is the perfect fit of the 10 million, eventually what happens is that little receptor in green will actually spit off and go into the blood and go and find that target. That's what we know as an antibody. You've probably heard of antibody, antibody test, antibodies against COVID, right? Antibodies after a vaccine. Antibodies are one of your biggest long lasting immune protections, but they also offer a lot of protection in the immediate time. So if these little antibodies go and bind and they're out here and they find the big like bad thing, they'll probably find their little target right there. What antibodies do is they select this big bad bacteria to be destroyed by heavier duty hitting cells. They can also just swarm the thing and it can't move. Because trust me, you are pushing out basically quadrillions of little antibodies during an active infection. So many, more than you could ever imagine. And they're just flooding your bloodstream. 
So the role of an antibody is it is a customized defense molecule. And it looks pretty, it looks pretty innocent, doesn't it, right? It's just this little Y-shaped thing. This is just a little look into what that evolution looks like and why a B-cell response will take you three to seven days or so. Because in that lymph node, when that piece of disease is floating around as sort of the like, here's the sample here, all the B cells in that lymph node are competing to see who can bind best. Does their antibody bind the best? For the ones that do not bind, and you'll see they're kind of misshapen, right? That one has like a little square, it's not gonna fit. That one's a little smooth, it's not gonna fit. They will die a horrific death, sadly. This is basically a who's gonna eat and who's not. I always kind of say this is kind of like, you know the shark species that the mom will have multiple babies in the womb and then the babies start killing each other and only one comes out? It's kind of like one of those. Super duper fast evolution, super duper sad for everybody else. But what that means is you find the one out of the 10 million that can defend against that pathogen. Now the question is, how the hell did that show up, right? Why are all these little antibody genes so different? It is the same gene. It is a gene, technically. But this is the first example of a sort of a mega gene I'm going to show you. That little Y that you're seeing is built from thousands of different possible combinations. So in blue on the right, those are the protein genes that they're pretty standard. You make the Y shape, right? But everything else, all those little colors in the beginning, you need to choose at least one from those. And what you're looking at is sort of a pared down piece by piece. And what is happening in a B cell is you are slicing and dicing that region of the genome. You are cutting out the ones you don't want. And it is a random process. Now, random among 10 million, what you'll start to see is that there will be massive variation in this binding region, won't there? The right V combination with the right J combination may be the perfect binding for a certain subspecies of COVID, right? That you've never seen. And only those chemical amino acids are the ones that get the job done. Other combinations will fail. They will make a protein, a little antibody that doesn't get the job done. They'll die. The one that does, and it forms that 3D protein shape that perfectly binds to whatever this unique piece is, that's the winner. And it will go in a cycle and survive and make lots of clones of itself. Eventually, it's going to be the only one. But this is a heavy duty application of linked genes, splicing, and just general DNA to RNA to protein. So, what you always end up with eventually is just one. It's one gene per B cell. Now, the evolution of this is super cool, but we don't have time for it. Sorry. You just got to know what it does. This is a good little detailed piece. I put this in the key info, a little more detail on what's happening, what's splicing, what's going on. But each one of us has a unique array of these genes and possibilities. Each time we're infected, one last thing happens too. Not only are you going to select from that big set of combos, but this, and this is the only part of the genome that does this, but you will mutate the genes over and over and over again in sort of a hyper-evolution like soup, basically. Maybe you change one arginine to a lysine and it's a better fit all of a sudden. This is the only spot in the, in the body that does this, where you will turn on a mutagen in your body, just in this region, to make things a little bit better, maybe. It gets going. So even after you've selected all this good combo of genes, You'll keep making changes until one is like beyond the perfect fit. This is why antibodies are typically considered your best piece of defense. It's because they are engineered over and over in all these different myriad of ways, including mutation to drive evolution. They can bind almost anything. The big reason lymphomas are the seventh most diagnosed cancer on the planet, right? Mutating yourself comes with some risks. Okay, 
So this is red text, but it's essentially the same thing we've been talking about. Eventually that 3D shape will have the amino acids that are perfect, a perfect active site, if you want to call it that, to whatever your antigen is, whatever your crazy parasite or bug is that you've ingested. In three to seven days, you will have a little army of these antibodies and they'll swarm it. So pretty fun. And I'm a B cell person. T cells are lame. This is good. Now, think about how we can apply this. So now beyond infection, I needed to do this lecture for this slide. I needed to do this before we could do the sequencing. I told you that we have a very hard time creating a protein, right? A 3D shape. We can make antibodies to just about anything though, synthetically. All we take usually is a little bunny rabbit. It's Easter time, right? Usually the rabbit survives, by the way, so it's okay. Well, some of them. But you put in an antigen into a rabbit. Now this antigen in this case, it could be anything. It could be any protein. It doesn't have to be an infection. Let's say we, we just want to make an antibody that binds a cell receptor that we like, right? You just put that in the rabbit, hyperdrive its B cells. Rabbit starts spitting out tons of antibodies just for our target. So synthetically, we can turn to this, not just as a research tool. Like if we wanna grab a certain gene, antibodies are the way we do it because we can make nearly whatever we want here. It's our only time that we can actually make a protein. And you know, still, we're not actually synthesizing it. The rabbit system is technically. Classic biotech, we basically just steal something. But the other thing is antibodies are very good. I think if we could make antibodies against tumor antigen, right? Send them in. Do that all the time. I'm getting very good at it too. So we are good to take a break here, but I will leave this. Because this slide, like I said, the fact that we can create 3D proteins that can bind to whatever target we want, that's probably the thing that you will see the most about on the exam. Like I said, maybe indirectly, but it's gonna pay to know.
Wait. All right, so brief foray into T cells. They are far less a, a good example of genetics at work. They have a similar somewhat system for their receptors of being a little customized for things. Um, it's not as cool as B cells, so we're not gonna talk about it. But they do a lot of good stuff by signaling how to kill stuff. Some of you will have more toxic cytotoxic T cells. Some of you have more array of cytokines that your helper T cells can spread, little signals to say, hey, activate. So again, some of this kind of plays to that polygenic nature of, immuno of the immune system. But to start T cells off, of course, I'm gonna start with B cell stuff. Who's ever seen the, uh, you know, live longer with Keytruda, little pharma, pharma company commercials, right? There it is. We made an antibody against a cell surface receptor called PD-1 on tumor cells. What PD-1 does is it is like a stop signal to a tumor, to a uh, T cell. So a lot of tumors will engineer basically this camouflage. They'll express PD-1 when they're not supposed to. The tumor cell ignores them, or sorry, the T cell ignores them because it's invisible. It's like, oh, that cell's fine, PD-1's out there. So by blocking this with an antibody that we engineered just in a nice little rabbit, I got it all mixed up. God damn it. <laughs> sorry, PDL1, there it is. Yeah. And if so, basically, what we're doing, sorry, what Keytruda does is it takes the breaks off a T cell. PD1 is something that would actually stop the T cell from killing stuff. So, sending in Keytruda, blocking that, the T cell just goes nuts on everything it sees, more so the tumors. So, it's fun because my PhD boss, he actually figured that out and he tested it in the mouse and it like cured it of a Hodgkin lymphoma. And so it's kind of it's cool. He was mean, but he was definitely really smart. <laughs> so it's good. And it goes to show how simple tools like these can have massive effects. So as far as T cells go as well, they are the example that we talked about with CCR5. They're the target of HIV. So with the reported twins that were born edited as embryos, they lost that. They lost that CCR5 gene. Now, you're immune to HIV. But as we know, genes have a role usually. So knocking that thing out, is that a great move? Like we talked about with CRISPR, you're running around 20 to 30 nicks somewhere else in the genome in each of the twins. Now, supposedly they're still alive. The cool, so the fact is the first cell that was ever truly edited was a T cell to be immune to HIV. This will be, Kind of the beginning of that, a trend in this this sort of style of medicine. Like I said, any change, any change you make here, you can make any almost any change. So, most of us deal with something like this too. This is autoimmunity. So in this case, you're looking at MS. Sometimes some of your immune cells will get a little angry at your normal proteins for some reason. Sometimes it's just a missed handshake or signal something, but that's autoimmunity. If your immune cells start to think that a piece of you is an enemy, they'll obliterate it. This is the case of type one diabetes where the insulin, the pancreas cells, the beta cells that secrete insulin, they unfortunately become the target. This is also the case with celiac disease. Plant pollen or grain looks a whole lot like parasite, unfortunately, to some of your cells and they'll freak out like a parasite is coming to get them and they'll make a memory response against that. Equally, we talk about the environment acting on you, right? And how that affects all these like mental or physical conditions, things like that. A lot of what you do and a lot of what your environment feeds in and causes epigenetic changes, it's gonna be how your immune cells behave. So the difference between being out in nature and smoking, the difference between getting good sleep and bad sleep, we are definitely very much acting in the realm of what, how, how your immune cells are gonna take that. So in all the medicine that we have, sometimes it is just a little bit better to 
give them a little bit of a break. Question is down here, why do you get sick the week of exams? Because you're not sleeping, you're stressed and your chronic glucocoid response is on. That doesn't, that says to your immune system, don't, don't, you know, don't play ball, don't spend energy, I'm stressed about something else. Remember, we have the same stress systems as zebras. When zebra's running from a lion, you don't got time to feed your immune cells energy. You got to get out of there. So when you're stressed, even chronically for a test, you're telling your immune cells, hey, something else is more important. I wish it was as easy as just telling you all to chill, which it's not like the environment helps that though. Um, it's not break time because we already took break time. Yeah, I don't know. It's probably not break time. We just took one. All right, you want to see some cool stuff and then we're almost done. Okay, all right. So who, showed, who saw this show? It's called Netflix, the, it's called The One, where basically this lady did a startup where you'd sequence your genome and they'd match you to the person that like you are like the best fit with. Scary. It was kind of fun. The book was better, my wife said. But is that, is that out of bounds though? Genetically, are we, are people better fits? Take a little look here. We know that in the animal kingdom, genetics plays a huge role in who mates with who. Now, this gets a little less complex than humans does, obviously, but on one hand, if you can defeat in combat, you obviously have like a sort of healthy set of genes. You're not sickly. But over here, wouldn't that be really easy to find a male peacock as a predator and eat it, right? What was the advantage here? Darwin, this drove him mad. In, his first, in the first book, he was just so angry at why it looked like that, right? He was so pissed. He never found his answer because we didn't really know about the immune system as well yet. We didn't know about link genes either. I know, fun. Okay. Ah, there we go. The genes that drive color in sexually selecting species are typically right next to immune strength genes. This is another big deal why that linkage matters, why it plays a role, why genes that have a role somehow eventually find a way to be next to each other if evolution would have that. It's likely that in a peacock, that color gene was not next to the immune gene for a long time, but a translocation maybe happened, maybe it switched. And now suddenly the strange partnership showed up where? If you've got good color, it means you've got high immune genes. It's a visual look at the male's ability to survive. And trust me, when it comes down to conservation, ecology, animals, everything, that strength of immune system is your biggest one in a lot of cases. As far as who is choosing who for healthy offspring, what they're choosing for is an immune system typically. Equally, all the behaviors you see, like with uh, bighorn sheep, you know, ramming each other and stuff, they're not going to be able to do that if they're sick. Or the one that's sick is going to go down a lot quicker. That's why these displays and these dances, remember that little bird of paradise in one of the Discovery Channel things where it like hops around and stuff? That coordination and that balance is key in on how like sick you're feeling. And if you're too sick, it's terrible. It's not a good dance. So this is always a fun one here too. And this connects a little bit of what we've talked about. I know we take smell for granted. I'll let you kind of read through that. little bit nuts, huh? I think there's been two or three times that this experiment is repeated and it's the same result, but it makes sense the animal kingdom. Now what you want in a mate technically, and then we're talking animal here, obviously psychology with humans gets a little different because you will experiences can move our brains quite a bit more, but the end goal remains. 
This is what I talked about, who survives and who doesn't. You want the most diverse immune setup as possible. Remember I talked about those NK cells and what collection of those receptors you have, right? The ideal offspring will have all of them. This means that naturally animals will tend to try and find mates that have a different immune system than them. In the human example, our microbiome is the most, is the best translation of that because your immune system decides what species of bacteria are allowed to live on you. And as a consequence, we can actually smell those. So in a way, smell is sort of an assessment of somebody's immunity, somewhat. Like I said, humans, things get a little different with humans every time. So who survives and who doesn't? This comes down to your diversity, what you have as far as your immune cells go. Get that all the way up. This is why a lot of the times in Europe, when you hear about bubonic plague, you'd hear about whole villages going down at once. That is because back in medieval feudal Europe, pretty much had the same thing running around in all the families, oops. And if they weren't good against bacteria, they all died. Imagine these little receptors are from different geographic areas, one from where parasites is prevalent, one where viruses, one where bacteria, and maybe one for where there's fungi or something, right? perfect offspring would combine these. You would have the best array from which to choose. Because most of us in this room, we, our immune system is somewhat incomplete. There are receptors we're missing. Those, those of us that have a bad reaction to COVID, maybe we do not have the same number of inherent viral killing receptors as others. Now, the other thing, and I think I've mentioned this before, as far as the, uh, as far as the polygenic histogram of immune strength goes, here's men, here's women in red. Women are better because X chromosome is massive, thousands of genes, tons of which are immune genes. Men have one shot at some of these, women get two shots, you're better off. Everybody always had like some issue with this and the hypothesis was like, well, like, why is that the case? And it's like, it's basic evolution. Women are more important to homo sapiens species survival. That's that. It's gonna be the case when you see the uh, X versus Y, but translated to different types of species. It depends on who has that Y. They're usually less important. <laughs> you only need one of them usually. Okay, another setup of linked genes, something called HLAs. These HLA receptors, there's tons of them. You get to pick and choose how many and what variants you got. This is an example of lots of different genes, lots of different strengths of each gene. And the cool thing is with HLA genes, these are little receptors that come on your T cell. They're all in the same spot on chromosome six, all linked, whole thing. And so when these activate in your T cells, the whole family shows up. And as far as what you get from your parents, this is the big collection of which version of each one of these are you gonna have. And that setup is a very good determinant of who, when you encounter specific diseases, how well will you do? How many tools do you have? Because the more you do, better. Let me get someone ready here. Oh, it is there. Nice. Okay. So, Take a break and we'll see the final stuff.
All right, so as powerful as everything we've got, we do lose this battle, people die. The immune system sort of runs out of steam as you get older sometimes, um, but equally, some pathogens are exceedingly good at evolving responses against mammal immunology. HIV is one of these examples up here. It can shift what it looks like. It doesn't have any editing mechanisms. It'll always be strange depending on the patient. It'll always be unique. It's something called antigenic shift or drift. So remember with antigen, that was that piece that we evolved a response to. If a week later it changes, got to do it again. And maybe at this point you've spent too much energy on it. COVID variants are different. COVID variants are slow moving, trust me. I've only had what, four over the last two years that have, I can remember. That's not a very fast evolving disease. That's why COVID's so infective. It's very simple and good what it does, but it doesn't do this. New variations have to happen across its you know, species pool. Can't happen in a patient. The other way we lose a lot of the time, too much power on the side of the immune system. So those of you that are like, I want the extreme immune system, maybe don't. This is why women deal with more autoimmunity than men. Your immune systems are much better. That's what killed everybody in the 1918 flu. The immune system would get exhausted fighting the virus and that sneaky little smooth bacteria would move in, kill you. What you're looking at on the left is an eosinophil, a small, parasitic hunting immune cell of yours. We don't have any parasites anymore though, right? None. Who's seen uh, Jurassic World with Chris Pratt, Pratt, right? Yeah, remember he's like, with the Indominus Rex, he's like, she doesn't know what century she's in and she's pissed. That's kind of like your immune system here. That eosinophil is mad and it's looking for a worm to kill. So if you sniff up some plant pollen, looks like a eukaryotic cell, go nuts. There's your allergies or worse sometimes. Not to say you don't want these around when the time comes. Equally, your immune system can be deceived. Some things look extremely not mammal eukaryotic like, like viruses on the left. Bacteria also are pretty unique. Things get a little more dangerous as you keep going up this sliding scale because you start looking a lot like you. And equally, our medicines have a harder time going up this scale because we can't kill the healthy cells. We only can kill the non-healthy ones. That's why killing a cancer cell can be so tough. In a lot of ways, it looks the same. Not to say your immune system does not have that power to detect that. <laughs> Don't get one of these. You're done. Not a good time. So as far as biotech goes, what if we don't have the inherent tools to win? Can we introduce them? Mongoose, they're cute looking, but man, they're vicious. <laughs> they're, like, they're like weasels time, like, like times 10, really nasty. So if you send these loose after a population of invasive snakes, snakes are gone, hopefully. That's, that was the intention on Hawaii. Turns out the snakes hunted day and the mongoose hunted night, so they just killed more birds. Oops. But we talk about antibiotics and how they're kind of carpet bombs for prokaryotes. Could we engineer a bacteriophage that only killed the infection you have, spared the rest of your healthy bacteria, spared you of those side effects? Sounds a little strange, a little messed up. But those of you considering any biotech type stuff, keep an eye on this. These things are very good at what they do, and we've already relied on organisms in the past to do, our, to do their jobs. But we met these before, chimeric antigen T cells. These would typically be an answer on some of the biotech, one of the answer options. You would see that there would be pieces of DNA engineered. You wouldn't see it integrated into the genome, but you would see a very active immune system. Because remember what we're doing here is we are genetically modifying that T cell to show up with a synthetic cancer killing gene and set it loose. So although there's no red text on here, CAR-T will often be in some of the practice questions as an option. So to differentiate that, remember, look for immune activity, look for pieces of plasma DNA, but not integration. At least not integration into the tumor or the other cells. But, like I said, this is kind of like the way we lose as well. This maybe is just blue text, my bad. 
We'll do that for everybody just scooting along on YouTube when they watch the recording. Yeah, I heard some laughs out there, you little shits. So eventually there are ways that we lose this, obviously. That phenotype of who survives can't always have it. Just like any complex phenotype, there are pieces that shift that equation one way or another, pleiotropic determinants. Having a set where you can't make a T cell receptor, will that'll do that to you. That'll shift you the wrong way, for example. But we'll answer this question a little bit. First, I did want to address anything general about the practice questions if we have a moment. If you guys do have access, you can go into those for a bit. Equally, there's more writing points available now on D2L, hooray, or not hooray, I don't know. What I want you to do with this next one that's up there, a lot of you have that uh, biotech creation, whatever you did. First off, I do want you guys to at least skim through those, skim through the titles and see if anything interests you, because I think Thursday we'll actually spare some time to talk about those and see like, hey, like were some of these like really, really cool? Because I want to give credit where credit's due to anybody. So when you get the chance, skim through those, but there is another eight points up for grab. This time, what I want is imagine that I have, you know, parasitized $1,000 of your tuition as I do, right? I just pocket it in cash. I want to invest that in a biotech startup. Find me one. Find me the best one you can. And defend why that's the one that we put the $1,000 in. Maybe I'll really do it. I don't know. Probably not. So it'll be on, it'll be on D2L for you. So it should be. Can everybody find it? Kind of like someone's there. All right, good. Sweet. So before we answer, what is the final role of the immune system? Because it is fun. It's a fun story. I loaded that. There it is. Hooray. Anybody brave enough to have a general question? Maybe if I face this way and I can just hear you, that's better. <laughs> but going through this, see if anybody has the same questions as you. See if there's too many. See if some of the formats are unique. Hopefully you see the direction I'm trending you towards with some of these. Now, obviously, same pattern exists as always that we've done. A couple of these are just on the exam. Why not, right? I want to write it again. And it's good practice for you. It rewards your learning. My hope, and the reason there's so many, is I do want to, what I want is that if anybody's done this, done all of them and like come to that explanation part where you're like, okay, I'm between these two for these reasons, at least getting to that stage with every question. I want that to be enough prep for everybody to pass. That's my goal. Now I can't track who does and what and et cetera, but hopefully this is a good enough resource. Or equally, does anybody want me to go over one? We've got about four minutes. Or is there an area that's not super great so far? It's a bit of a broad ask, I suppose, right? All of them? Okay, we can do one. Good. Let's do. Hmm. It's sort of a compromise. Epigenetics is involved here as a potential. Try 62. You'll notice how today sort of factors into these big ones. Like I said, I'm not going to be testing what's CAR T, but you will have to differentiate when it's involved or when it's not. Man, if only I had a pull everywhere here. Too bad.
You've had some time to collect your thoughts, see what you have in common and what you don't have in common with anybody around you if you want. See what pieces you can easily cross off here. Who feels pretty confident in themselves? What? None of you? Oh, it's okay. It's good we're doing this early, right? Because when is the, oh yeah, the test, Thursday, May 5th, 8 a.m. in here. Do not pull an all-nighter, okay? I had four people pull an all-nighter last year. Guess how many of them failed? Five, that's how bad it was. <laughs> yeah, but seriously, three of them did, so don't. One of them fell asleep in the online test. <laughs> just dropped it like nine, like, like nine, 10, just no answer, no answer, no answer, no answer. It was brutal. That situation was fixed. They had to take the hard essay style exam to get those points back. So it was fair. All right, so got any of these that are easy to cross off based on the info that I gave you? None? Shoot, okay. Sequencing the DNA from tumors with and without treatment. No altered regions in DNA. Which one of these answers alters DNA? Yay, good job, CRISPR. Patient T cells behave abnormally, but do not showcase any special abilities against the tumor. If it was a CAR T cell, you'd probably imagine they'd be going nuts, right? Like killing and shredding and everything, right? Probably not here. Okay, patient immune system as a whole behaves a little abnormally, as do lots of types of cells after this. Mm. Kind of helps confirm what we saw. Now, multiple oncogenes have lost expression, lower RNA levels. Seems pretty promising, right? Multiple tumor suppressor genes have increased expression. So promising. That doesn't actually do well to eliminate some of our answers though, does it? Couldn't I have knocked those out with mRNA? Couldn't I have inhibited the epigenetics here? Couldn't I have inserted new genes to have more tumor suppressor, right? Keep reading. Also notice it's not just the targets you wanted. Lots of genes have weird expression. Then the big, you don't see any abnormal RNA. You don't see any abnormal plasmid. How would you have gotten that DNA virus in there with tumor suppressors, right? No dice. So kill off the plasmid, kill off the engineering, kill off the mRNA knockout. Who feels okay about A? Yeah. Played with fire a little bit, it was good. Triggered it on massive. If you take out one of those master regulators out of a tumor, sometimes the combo of on and off that goes just kills the whole thing. It's amazing. Woo, -hoo, good job. See, I do give you guys answers. Fine, stop being babies, work hard, suffer. Okay, last, we'll end on a fun story. Well, it's not fun at all actually, but still. Sweet, okay, last bit. So in all our medicine, all our everything, if we can defeat pathogen, if we can defeat mutation, if we can defeat mitochondria aging, we have one last thing to do. 
So I showed you this image. There's a neuron. It's, we're in our brain. Good. I told you before about schizophrenia, a little bit related with autism, that the genes of people with and without the atypical conditions, a lot of the genes that are changed or up in those conditions, psychiatric ones included, they're immune genes. The first time we did this, we were like, God, the stats just suck. Sequencing isn't good enough. And we moved on for about 15 years. Then we started seeing that immune genes play a much bigger role in the brain than we thought. So all I'll ask you right now as an example, everybody think of your favorite memory with your sibling right now, right? Memory exists for all of us and it's unique, except for us hideous only children, we're screwed. We can remember our dogs. Now, the reason that certain memories are burned in and others aren't is that connections between neurons are the important part, okay? These legs, these dendrites, and how many and where they connect, that's what makes the unique images in our brain. Now, as you get older, some connections go by the wayside. You need to make room for more, literally. Microglia are these little cells right here, little immune cells. Their job is to prune connections. They make room for bigger ones to come, right? make room to make sure that the right neurons are in the right spot. They have a bit of a role defending the, the brain from any infection, but you got the blood brain barrier for that and kind of your standard soldiers for that. Now the final job of the immune system though, I know I only got a minute, is to kill you. Everything about, that we know about neurodegeneration as well, standard, not uh, disease, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, their immune genes. The microglia begin to kill connections they're not supposed to. They begin to eat neurons. Why? Well, you don't need to look farther than a wolf pack, right? If you get old or you get without a role, People say retirement's the biggest thing that kills people. If you don't have a role, your brain notices that. Certain signals start showing up that say, well, you're not bringing much to the pack anymore. That's the hypothesis why this trigger set of pathways happens. Is that when the right signals are fed and the brain is told your time has sort of come, the microglia start to attack progressively and slowly. And those of us with people that we know with neurodegeneration know how tough this can be to watch. But that's also why messing with these cells with different drugs and crap and Teflon and other stuff, you don't wanna do it. So kind of a haunting little unfortunate side. I remember reading this the first time and being uh, slightly disturbed and upset, but everything that has a beginning has an end, right? Remember this grim feeling for the final. Okay, that's enough. We'll see you guys.